Now we are going to talk about the elements that go into building a model. So when we are considering an exposure scenario that we wish to model, we first need to look at these following steps. We need to find out how a particular substance or chemical is going to be used and understand its properties. Is it, for example, a volatile chemical such as toluene or benzene? Is it a dust that is being generated by a mechanical process and so on? We need to then understand the exposure scenarios covering the typical actual conditions of the use of the substance and identify the core determinants of exposure. So for example, is it like in the example we just discussed, is it some ore being dumped from a rail car onto the floor and thereby generating dust? Or is it two chemicals being mixed out in the open or two chemicals being mixed inside a lab hood? So we need to understand what are the determinants, the environmental conditions under which the exposure happens. And then we assess the exposure using our model and assess the risk. And then finally, determine the effect of the assumptions that go into our model. So the three most fundamental elements in any exposure model are as follows. So we need to know the rate at which the contaminant is being emitted. And this is the mass emission rate. The second one is we need to know the dispersion of the contaminant in the room air or the environment air. And then we also need to know where is the worker, where is the individual in this room? So we need to know the individual's time activity pattern. Let's look at the mass emission rate function first. As you can imagine, the emission rate can be any kind of function. It could vary with time in any kind of way. But most of the models that we are going to consider assume two types of variations with time. The first one is will, the models will assume a constant mass emission rate, meaning it doesn't change with time. And the second one is that the emission rate exponentially decreases over time. And like I said, any time varying function can be modeled, although in my lectures today and the next lecture, we will not be discussing these arbitrary time varying functions. Next, we need to understand the contaminant dispersion pattern. Again, for the sake of simplicity, we'll start off with a very simple assumption. And this is called the well-mixed room assumption. And this model assumes that the concentration is uniform throughout the room. It is the same throughout the room at all points of time. The second slightly more complicated dispersion pattern is called the near field and far field dispersion pattern. And this assumes that the concentration is highest in the near field of the source and lower in the far field, so in the remainder of the room. And within each respective field or zone, the concentration is uniform. So basically, in the well-mixed room, we have one box. And in the near field, far field model, we have two boxes, one within the other. A third one is the turbulent diffusion model and here the model assumes that the concentration of the airborne contaminant continually decreases with distance from the source in a symmetrical or asymmetrical way. So these first three models make some simplifying assumptions which lead to a relatively simple mathematical expressions for the contaminant concentration in a room. And they are sort of realistic or unrealistic depending on a scenario, and we'll talk about this more later. But much more in-depth and realistic model is made using computational fluid dynamics. Unlike the first three bullets, the computational fluid dynamics modeling is very resource intensive, computationally intensive, but it produces very realistic simulations of the airflow in the workplace. We may not necessarily need that level of detail in most industrial hygiene, occupational health scenarios. And so we will actually not be discussing computational fluid dynamics, although I want to mention it for the sake of completeness and so that you know that if we are dealing with a scenario where the more complex dynamics are important, 
then we have access to another tool. The last parameter we need to know is the worker's time activity pattern. So a worker may be in a room with one or more emission sources for only part of the shift, or the sources may emit for only part of the shift, and we need to know that to properly model the individual's exposure. A worker may spend time at different locations relative to the same emission source, so we need to account for the spatial variation in the airborne contaminant level. And the time activity pattern is then used to determine the shift or eight-hour time-weighted average exposure level. So again, the models that we are going to talk about today, they include the first two parameters, namely the mass emission rate and the contaminant dispersion pattern, and they'll predict a room concentration. The models then need to be supplemented with this individual time activity pattern. And so I'm not going to discuss this too much later, but I just want you to keep that in mind that we need to understand where the individual is in a particular environment. So what are some of the key parameters and models that we are going to be discussing? The first one is obviously the room or the volume of the space denoted by V, and it has units of volume, for example, cubic meters or cubic feet. We need to know the rate at which the air moves through the room. So this is the supply air or the exhaust air rate, and it is commonly denoted by capital Q, and it has units of volume per unit time, or cubic meters per minute. Then we need to know the rate at which the contaminant is being emitted into the room air, and it is commonly denoted by the letter G, and it has units of mass per unit time, or milligrams per minute. The later models that we'll be discussing also include other parameters. So for example, we may need to know the random air speed in the room, denoted by lowercase s in meters per second or feet per minute. We need to know the advective airflow, meaning not the random air speed, which is you know randomly in different directions, but if there is a directionality to the airflow in the room, that is denoted by capital U. If we use the turbulent eddy diffusion model, we will need to use this more uncommon parameter called the turbulent eddy diffusion coefficient, or d sub t, which has units of area per unit time, or meter square per second, for example. One other thing to briefly mention at this point, and we'll discuss it more later on in the course, is the distinction between what are called deterministic and probabilistic models. So the models that we're going to be talking about today are called deterministic models, meaning there is a straightforward equation and a value is specified for each model parameter. And if each respective value is the same, the model output is also going to be the same. Later on in the course, we'll be discussing probabilistic models, meaning we'll not just give one value to a model parameter, but we'll provide a distribution of values for each model parameter. And so what the model will provide is a distribution of possible outcomes. So this is called a probabilistic model as opposed to a deterministic model. This is a quote attributed to Albert Einstein. I cannot vouch for its accuracy, but it captures the philosophy of modeling. Things should be kept as simple as possible, but not simpler. And what it means is that we should use the simplest model that provides the detail required for our particular exposure assessment scenario. And so we need to increase in complexity only so much as it serves our purpose. We don't need to go for the most high-powered model every time because we may spend more resources running the model than is really worthwhile. So keeping that in mind, we are going to use a tiered approach to mathematical modeling from simple models to more complex models. So at the very simple level, we have the model called the saturation vapor pressure model. Then slightly more complex, we have a well-mixed room model with constant emission. Then we move to a well-mixed room model with variable emission. Then we move to the near-field, far-field model with constant emission. 
and then a near field, far field model with variable emission, then the turbulent eddy diffusion model with constant emission, and then the most complex of all is the computational fluid dynamics models. So the first four bullets are the ones that we are going to be talking about in this course. And the last three ones are just to illustrate the point that we are moving from very simple models to more and more complex models. And complexity comes with increasing cost, and so they are going to require more inputs to it. And the input parameters require that we spend some resources to figure out their values. So it'll require time, and somebody has to go and measure these model parameters and so there is a cost associated with using these models that increases as you go down this slide. 